Cool. Welcome everybody to our, I think it's our fifth uh, pro webinar webcast live series, right? Uh, today, introducing uh, Reed and James here. Hello. Uh, it's great to have you guys around. If you guys want to talk a little bit about who you are, what you do, and why are you here? Sure. Um, well, I'm not going to speak for James, except for the fact that we're both industrial designers. Um, and we've known each other for a long time. We've done a bunch of projects for MakerBot and just for ourselves all the way back to college. But I'm a senior industrial designer at R.O. Leiden, which is another design firm in Manhattan, and work on a wide range of products as a consultant. But yeah, what do you do, James? Uh, I'm a freelance industrial designer based in Brooklyn. So I work with a lot of tech startups. Um, and yeah, just uh, thank you for having us here. No, thank you guys yeah. for joining. And as we, you probably read through the emails, we're actually going to go through your guys' form family deck, which is uh, you know a piece that you created. It's really really interesting. In, you know, basically creating tools for a designer to iterate faster, right? To develop mm -hmm. shapes uh, that can help you develop a product faster. I don't know if you want to touch on the brief overview of what it is and how is it supposed to be used. Yeah. I mean, the form families, so they were developed by Joseph Ballet, who mm -hmm. was a professor at Carnegie Mellon, uh, I think he's also a co-founder of Maya Studios out in Pittsburgh. Uh, he was the one who first taught us the form families. And the way that I like to think about them is they are a framework through which you kind of push through your, your product in order to uncover mm -hmm. unexpected forms, new forms. Um, things that you might not consider if you're trying to work too many things out in your mind before you put it down on paper. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this definitely goes with the whole topic that's going all over Instagram recently of like, how do you actually work? Mm -hmm. This is something that we all do when you're trying to get quick ideas out. You're not sitting there and doing an hour per drawing. It's yeah. how do you use this general framework to just pump out a bunch of ideas? Because you had an episode of Minor Details about designer block. Everyone gets it at some point, mm -hmm. and this is a way that I don't use it every project, but if I'm sitting there and I'm stumped, I'll just break these four things out and work through them, and hopefully something cool pops out of it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, we'll get started with, you know, here we have a nice deck that Jans, our design, graphic designer, put together. Basically, uh, well, we talked about the quick intro, and then if we go to the next slide, what we want to, to capture is also how does these quick sketches relate to 3D sketches, or what we would call 3D sketches, right, with the, with the printers at hand. So here we have our printer family going all the way from the Red Plus method and the Z18. We have the method, our uh, brand new printer just got a uh, Red Dot Award. <laughs> We're super excited about that too. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty sweet thing. Uh, and then if we get into, you know, back into the details of, of or the background of this guide, uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, yeah, you were you were touching about you know the creation of this, and I'll mm -hmm. let you guys run with this one from this from here on, and then I'll come back in a second. But so that's take it over that's good old Joe Bill, hey? Oh yeah, he he's the one that James touched on before, and he came and was a visiting professor at Virginia Tech and taught us this what nine ten years ago almost. Yeah. Um, so we definitely give him a lot of credit for starting this, but then our professor Mitzi Vernon was the person who took it and ran with it even further at Virginia Tech. And it's something that's kind of stuck with both of us. And James has come to my class at Parsons and he helps teach this every semester to my students. Mm -hmm. So just something we've used for a while. And you want to talk about each of the families? Sure. Um, so first you have the Tectoform family, um, which is basically, I, I like to think of it in a few different ways. And there's a few different ways that you can generate these ideas. They're very architectural in nature. Um, they're very structural. So you can either sort of build framework around to create your object or you can even you know imagine folding paper you know and getting these very planar forms almost kind of like low poly forms the roto forms those gener those are generated off of a central axis so yeah. everything is revolved around that axis so there's mm -hmm. symmetry there the axis itself doesn't have to be straight it can be curved um, but generally, yeah, it's, uh, it's a profile revolved symmetrically about the axis. Flow forms, you think of sort of like speed forms and automotive forms mm -hmm. where you have, there's a certain directionality to these forms. There is a, there's a flow to these forms. Uh, and then plastiforms uh, are more pebblish. They're more like beans. They, they have, they're sort of defined by those axes, um, you know, the X, Y, and Z. 
and they're a bit more, I guess, organic or I don't know, how would you describe them? Curvy. Yeah. So yeah, those are kind of the general overview of those form families. Okay. Yeah, and I think these are all things like when James comes to my class at Parsons and we talk about this, there's everyone has their strengths and weaknesses when they're sketching. Some people like me like to have very strict rules in their learning. So like tecto forms would be good for you in the beginning because it means perspective and then you cut, slice, add. And same thing with rotoforms, where if there's an axis, you draw things around it and you connect them. Yeah. But then some people like things a little more free flowing and don't have that. So plastiforms and flow forms might actually come a little more organically to you, where you just draw shapes and then kind of add section lines and connect them to see kind of what is the result of all these different lines you put down. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great intro. I'll let you guys get started to it, like the hands on part of this. Cool. I would also remind everybody uh, watching us or just joining through YouTube. Do ask questions, we will be answering them as we go or at the end as well. So there's that little chat bar uh, on the right hand of your screen, should be popping up. We have Allison and Anastasia running through those, you know, behind cameras and Matteo behind the, the, the main camera. But do feel free to ask questions and let us know if you have any, any specific uh, yeah, ideas about this. And with that, I'll let you guys to it. Yeah, All right. thank you. Yeah, please do. James and I know this already. So <laughs> we want to help you guys out. Yeah, so. Uh, what we're going to be drawing today, we're, we're going to be drawing uh, pencil sharpeners. Recently, uh, yeah, Render Weekly, which is an Instagram page, they uh, they did a, a challenge around pencil sharpeners. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, you know, we, we originally did these watering cans, and I think that pencil sharpeners also lend themselves well to, like, this kind of exercise and just showing the breadth mm -hmm. and the range of different types of forms you can generate around this object. Yeah, I think it's also nice when you think about the form families because a lot of times you're designing around a problem and this is an opportunity where you can think about that problem but you also are just thinking about what does it look like? Right. How does this thing actually express itself? Yeah. And you can do that very clearly with each of these different families in different ways. Right. And and so, you know, we're going to be pushing these the pencil sharpeners through this framework through the four form families and mm -hmm. I think, you know, another thing that somebody approaching a pencil sharpener might do is just already assume sort of a cylindrical form, especially if they're doing a manual pencil sharpener, yeah. or, you know, that there might be another form family that they kind of, uh, you know, end up leaning toward because of their preconceived ideas about what a pencil yeah. sharpener is. And so by taking, you know, taking a manual pencil sharpener and thinking about how could it be more tectonic? How mm -hmm. could it be more architectural? So, so putting it through the tecto forms to discover uh, something new. Well, speaking of those, should we oh, yeah. quickly share what that looks like? Right. So this is from our watering can project. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the first exercise we did, which was the tecto forms for uh, these watering cans. Uh, so read. Yeah. Uh, so just quick explorations, probably not something I would make in real life, but what you're doing quickly, you can see these things. So sometimes you land on goals, sometimes you're like, that wasn't great, but sometimes you need to see what you don't love to understand what you do love. So this is this one where it's just two simple diamond shapes kind of lofted to each other with a handle, mm -hmm. very thin spout, so you can really precisely water your plants. Right. And, you know, Reed, if you wanted to, you could also take this form and what you learned from it in terms of its functionality and mm -hmm. soften these edges. And, yep. you know, you could essentially, you know, this is your framework. This is this is sort of the functional framework yep. of the design. And you could take it and soften soften these edges. And That's also why I think starting with tecto forms are the best ones, because these are the closest pure expression of perspective drawing. So if you can master perspective and draw these things, this is kind of what the underlay sketch for most drawings look like right. to begin with. So then, like you said, you can start cutting, smoothing, making more flowy forms. And once we go through them all, we can show you guys how you can combine them all to make things that are way different than just a single family by itself. Right. And so with my concept, it's, it's much more architectural, much more, I guess, like a pure tecto mm -hmm. or... Um, and so the idea here was that you have your planter in the middle and then you have, you know, coming up around it is your, is your watering can. Um, and so these actually live together so you would water it mm -hmm. and then you can put these back together. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I were to generate that using 
trying to get the final finish thing out right away. I mean, I could get super complex with this, but I think the nice thing about Tectoforms with this was I was able to sort of wrap my head around this concept fairly easily mm -hmm. by keeping the forms fairly simple. But once again, I could take this and I could run with it and make it softer or yeah. put, it, put it through another form family. So I guess when we get into sketching, what we can start talking about is I think a good lesson is we didn't have these ideas in our head until we started drawing tecto forms. Yeah. That's where I was like, oh, this spout could be cool. And that's what James said, oh, we can have this double family thing that lives together. Yeah. And that wouldn't have happened if we had just gone with the no notions we already had in our head before. Right. So let's get rid of these. <laughs> and I guess we should draw some watering cans. Or pencil sharpeners. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> My water Watering can words. pencil sharpeners. What about that? Hey, it's a billion dollar idea. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a few different ways that you can start out with a tecto form. Um, so Reed, maybe you could uh, you could start out by generating like sort of an overall shape. Well, I like how you do oh, this yeah. a lot of times, where you'll just kind of bend sheets, and you can see I'm kind of implying they continue going. But you can have things like this and start thinking about, well, what if now it actually goes up here, mm -hmm. and now I have this form where maybe if I connected it, yeah. and then maybe this is a door that opened onto it, and oh, you can start having weird yeah. things happen that you wouldn't have thought about if you just had, okay, I need an idea, how do I put it down on there? Right, right, and then, so, you know, so sort of the other general way that you might come up with these tecto forms is by generating your sort of outside shape. Mm -hmm. You So imagine, uh, I'm not going to liken myself to him, but Michelangelo taking a, taking a, <laughs> you know, a block of marble and finding the structure within there, finding the, you know, the form within that. So James, start, don't, sell, don't sell yourself short. I I don't know. So this is this is not the Pieta. So, um, so yeah, you can start sort of chopping away at mm -hmm. the form um, instead of sort of this uh, generative method that that Reed is showing right now. Yeah, I mean. I love everyone, if you're drawing in perspective, always has their base shape. I draw this basically the exact same rectangle all the time, just like James did. And once you have something like this, you can start thinking like, okay, now this guy is pretty simple, but what if I put an off-centered hole deep down inside of here, and then these all kind of go down to it. It looks pretty flat, not the best drawing in the world. <laughs> you want to fix it? Yeah, just... Uh... You know, don't be precious there about, you go. Okay, about your so sketches. Now, now, there you go. And you can see. Maybe it's clear on top, and it's actually a, oh. a piece that's going through there. And now when you go here, you see the pencil going inside of it. Yeah. And, of course, you can sort of, like, combine these methodologies. So I'm actually doing a sort of cutting and building, and, you know, that's another way that you could do it is start with a, start with a form and then... I think something everyone else needs to realize is that it doesn't matter if you can see all these construction lines. Right. If you really love this sketch, you can always take a piece of paper afterwards, go on top of it, sketch over it again, like an underlay. Yeah. Or you can more likely probably take it and then just go into CAD and start developing it. Right. So right now, what I'm doing with this pencil sharpener is I have taken, I took my root form, which was again sort of this... Uh, this rectangular block here, and I just am adding onto it <clears throat> instead of subtracting from it. Um, so yeah, yeah, I like this idea. Of, I hate that my pencil sharpener have to go and like go like this. I wish I can just kind of have a, stick it in the front. Like right. I know that the ones are so. What if you had a very angled one mm -hmm. that just looks like post-it note type thing? I was like things that have dual functions. Yeah. What else could this be? Mm -hmm. So maybe it's just very simple and architectural. Just a bunch of blocks shoved together. Yeah. Um, or what if there's like a really funny tension or something? Like if it is just super skinny. And it's just a little yeah. hole right there. Yeah. And maybe actually there's a hole right there. And then over here is for more pencils. That all oh, stick up it's a pencil holder slash sharpener. Yeah. Who knows? There you go. I like that. Ooh, and then if it was clear, 
and you could see the sharpener part, and you could see where all the pencils end. It'd be kind of fun. I think that's something that's fun about these is that the forms themselves are pretty simple, but when you start adding in materiality, that's where it comes like, oh, this is a block. But now if I have a hard top and clear sides, or if it's frosted, or mm -hmm. if it's speckles, because everyone puts speckles in everything, you can know? <laughs> start doing all this cool stuff with it. Yeah. All right, let's do a few more of these. So I like the fact that you're already touching on multiple uh, directions. Mm -hmm. Carl is asking here in the, in the chat, like, how do you make sure that you're not committing to one particular direction from the get-go, right? How do you keep your ideas fresh in a way, I guess? Hmm. Um, I think it's about not being super precious with your ideas. If you think one idea is the best thing, you're never going to go any further. Um, I think it's also not feeling afraid to look, I don't know, silly a little bit. Right. Yeah, I mean, I drew, I just drew this one, which is maybe completely absurd, but I just kind of followed it. And, and maybe there's something that I can take from this where, <clears throat> you know, I kind of did this in and out form here. And maybe this is a nice grip for somebody to grab this area where all the shavings are falling. And, you know, I could take that into my next design. I mean, I don't think that this is the final design, but I, I think you can kind of discover something about any sort of sketch that you do, um, even if you're, even if it seems silly. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing is, that's why I love brainstorming, where there's no such thing as a bad idea. Someone could say something that seems absurd, but that might trigger a memory that you had from when you were eight that would right. be a great idea. So this one, it's like this weird kind of off-centered thing, doesn't really make much sense, it would probably fall over, but that gave me the idea of, reminds me of like Nick Baker's birdhouse thing, like mm -hmm. what if it was more of... Know, a house for all your pencil shavings. I don't, oh, know, why yeah. you, I don't know why you'd want that, but <laughs> it could be fun. Well, why not? Why not just make a make a chimney? Oh yeah, for the sharpener. Yeah, if you're gonna do that, you may as well go the whole way. Yeah, and then your pencils come out. This, this is a really short pencil. It's got it's been erased a lot. <laughs> it's That's been generating cool. a lot of form families. So it's interesting on that one, like the, the house, because again, Carl, like as a follow-up question, is saying, like, you know, how do you consider functionality when you're sketching? You know, mm -hmm. that's, um, I guess you're not trying to be bound by it at this point. I think this is something that's super early, so it's just whatever weird stuff comes out. Right. Especially like James and I like to brainstorm projects together. I think it's about feeding off of the energy of each other, or even just yourself and your sketches, and just seeing where it goes. It's not, I wouldn't do this the night before a project's due. I'd probably do this like <laughs> a week before something's due, but right. yeah, I wouldn't be precious about it. So like you can just, people take design way too seriously. <laughs> it can be, it can just be a fun activity a lot of times. Obviously when you're getting paid for it, it's a little different, but allow yourself to have some fun. I don't know what the heck this is, but actually that gives me an idea of like everyone does all these funky desk organizers now. It's like no student portfolios like done without a pencil organizer. Did you see that, James? Mm. Like everyone does them. But what if you had something that was more of like this zigzag shape? Mm -hmm. So here's another interesting one. Uh, I think Carly. Uh, they don't have their oh, names. Oh, we don't know the name of them, but they're asking about. As you're sketching here, what are you thinking prior to getting to the CAD steps of it? Mm -hmm. uh, what of the sketching part is helping you out with jumping into CAD? Uh, well, I feel like you have to, it depends what, what software you use. Uh, I use SolidWorks most often, so mm -hmm. it's very easy to fall into the trap of wanting to have a lot of dimensionality and parametric modeling when you're doing it. So if you have at least a little bit of a plan, you can kind of go in and have proportions. Right. But then again, if you use like Rhino or Fusion or ZBrush, something very organic and much more quick and iterative, mm -hmm. I guess doesn't matter as much. Mm -hmm. What do you think, James? Yeah, I mean, I think that part of this is really understanding your forms from the ground up. 
And so in that way, I think it's very informative once you get into 3D um, because you know, you're generating these forms, you're thinking about them, you're thinking them through, and you are, yeah, like especially with the tecto form, you are building sort of a scaffolding and you're understanding your forms better than you might if you just jumped right into 3D mm -hmm. with, a, with a rough idea. And also I think sketching is the fastest way ever to just show something. Oh yeah. So getting into cat, I think that's a, there's always the debate of where do you spend your time? And I think the most important thing as a professional designer is efficiency a lot of times. Yeah. Because you don't want to be the person who's there until <clears throat> midnight every day. Right. So get a bunch of ideas down, put them up on a board, critique it, say, okay, cool, this is terrible, like go through them all. Right. And then just quickly make them and then do sketch renders. And then you can draw on top of that, you can print it out, just whatever you can use to get through it as fast as possible. Yeah. Should we, uh, should move we move on? on? Let's, sure. Let's okay. move on to Why don't you give the background and I'll get the <clears throat> models. Yeah. So, uh, Rotoforms, as I was discussing earlier, <clears throat> you have a central axis um, around which you are creating a profile, which, which if you're, you know, if you're using CAD right now, it's sort of the way in which you would develop these kind of forms in CAD, mm -hmm. which is, you know, you establish what, what your axis is, what your center line is, and then you develop a profile. And from there, you generate ellipses symmetrically about the axis. And this is just one way to generate rotoforms. And then, you know, I would connect that on the other side. So, you know, that's one way. You can also take that center line you can generate a lot of ellipses mm -hmm. and then connect those all. But yeah, I mean, this lends itself obviously to vessels and things like that, or things that are accepting cylindrical shapes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you can also sort of think about it if you're not in SolidWorks, think about the potter's wheel. Yeah. I mean, it's like a really easy thing to imagine that central axis of the potter's wheel as the potter is creating this form that is uh, symmetrical about that axis. Yeah. So. Here's what we did last time. Yes. Right? Where'd this come from? Yeah, so this um, this is actually, so this is where uh, you might take things one step further, which is uh, intersecting two rotoforms. So this is fairly simple, but just this idea of combining the handle with the spout and then intersecting that mm -hmm. with the vessel. Um, so it, I just I, like came upon this idea of the X and, and uh, that was... That was where this came from. Yeah. Um, what about yours, Reed? Uh, people like this one online <laughs> because it was a failed idea. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. Or this is when James and I are brainstorming and come up with weird ideas type of thing where, who cares? Just try it. Yeah. So the idea was, what if you could water your plants like a maraca? Yeah. So this one is a pure roto form, where it has an axis and then this profile shape done around, super clear. And that was it. So you can see very different ideas. Yeah. But I think something else is good to start touch, touching on is even what you're doing here, James has his two, let me get rid of you, James has his axis, and he did a very uh, organic shape. So let's say we have one here, something here, and then something here. Mm -hmm. You can actually start blending the families together. If you make straight lines between them, right. it starts feeling like a tecto slash roto form. Right. So you can start taking these things and saying it's a flow roto blob form. Like, <laughs> putting three is probably a lot, but... Yeah, yeah. And one thing that I remember um, Mitzi, our professor at school, talking a lot about is, you know, there's this idea of fair curvature, which happens a lot in, in boat design. It's how they sort of assess the curvature of a boat, is if the, the curve is fair. Mm -hmm. So meaning that it's, it's continuous and there's no interruptions in it. Um, Whereas there's other types of curves which are, or lines that are intersecting. So like you're showing, I mean, the other, the other way that you could view that is you have this kind of shape where this kind of goes off into, you know, infinity. Mm -hmm. And then you come in and intersect it with another form. So it creates a hard line there. Um, so yeah, these are these are kind of different types of lines that yeah. we're working with. So straight lines, fair curves, and intersecting it's lines. It's kind of like what we're going to talk about, which I'm hoping all of you guys have seen already. 
But if you haven't, we're going to talk about it next. So basically, it's like this is kind of like a tecto line. This is yeah. kind of like a flow line. This is right. like a blob line that yeah. all go with this central axis idea to yeah. make you have rotoforms. Right. Yeah. So let's do some pencil sharpeners. Yeah. So I think the one that you're good at, too, that you've shown me that I've liked is giving yourself maybe like a curved spline. Oh, yeah. So it's like, yeah, this guy. Then maybe you put a really big one in the middle. And I usually like to give myself a crosshair just so I can know where I am in space. Mm -hmm. And then maybe another big guy. And now when you connect these, you're like, mm, I guess it's kind of more like over here. Yeah. And this one's like that. And then if you connect all the outer ones, so you end up with like a shape. I don't know what it is. Kind of like <laughs> a strange pencil sharpener. It looks like a horn or something. Right. So I think that you mentioned it before with the sketches and also with the maraca concept. You know, the importance of being able to both feel free to air with the sketches, with the prints. You know, what's the importance of printing something and having it physically, even if you know that it's just, you're testing the idea out. What's the relevance of that? Yeah, I think it's, I think the thing is, think of CAD like sketching sometimes too. I think this is the first point. Like I wouldn't go right into CAD usually. I'll at least have a few minutes of sketching something. But then when you get it into CAD, you can quickly take this idea, put it on like a very low fill print and have it in a few hours, if not even less, depending on the scale. And then you can just start looking at them. And especially if you have a project where you have very visual people on your team, sketches will get you this far, but a 3D object will give you the rest and kind of fill in that gap. Right, right. And so as a follow-up, Solo uh, works by Solo is asking, you know, how, when do you start bringing in the functionality? Like, again, mm -hmm. taking that maraca as an example, when do you start being bound by, hey, this has to perform in a certain way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the points of this exercise is to sort of remove functionality from your mind, at least for a mm -hmm. moment. But you're always sort of considering it in the back of your mind and wondering how, how this might function once I've sort of drawn out my idea um, and then uh, yeah I mean I think that once you have enough sort of forms on the page where you can maybe combine things and start to consider functionality uh, taking that and then producing something producing a sketch that's a little bit more well thought out and then jumping in maybe jumping into CAD mm -hmm. maybe jumping into just like a crude model yeah, I feel like we're talking about form mostly right now, but there is no clear time of like, now I think of form, now yeah. I think of function. It's all going <laughs> to swirl in your head simultaneously. Yeah. But I think there's some times in which you don't want to think too much about the constraints because if you do, you might not get to that weird idea that right. might make the thing that still works a little more interesting than the first idea of how to execute something. Yeah. And I mean, there there are certain times like, so right now the, the form that I'm that I'm doing, which is very strange, is, uh, is this idea of, you know, so you have your area with the shavings, and maybe this form, this rotoform, is good for getting your hands around for gripping to pull this off so that you can dump out the shavings. Um, so, I mean, also functions, it, 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 there's no hard and fast rule about, like, don't think of functions while you're doing this because those functions could influence the form in that way mm -hmm. or the form could influence the function. Yeah, it's like I drew this one first. Yeah. Not the coolest idea, but then I was thinking, okay, what if I actually pull the portions down make the base really heavy mm -hmm. and now have this thing be something that is able to like roll around, yeah. like the Heatherwick chair. Like an, I don't know. Oh why. yeah. Like what if you're in a brainstorm, you need a pencil sharpener, you flick it, and it rolls. Like it rolls around to the next yeah. place. And like silly ideas, things like that. Yeah. That be fun. That's this, cool. This idea did not fully. I. That's I just. Reed, I just stole it. It's mine now. Okay, cool. That's <laughs> another thing. No one owns ideas. <laughs> People get so bad at a shape. That was my idea. No, there's no such thing as your idea. It's a group effort. Everyone's right. ideas are. They're yeah. All there. And that's the cool thing. I, I will say that's one of the cool things about uh, brainstorming and iterating with somebody else is that you guys can do this sort of um, improvisational sketching where you're feeding off of each other's ideas. Mm -hmm. Maybe the other person can see clearly what you're trying to achieve and you haven't seen it yet. Yeah. 
Um, but I think something else we can talk about quickly is you don't have to keep the form pure. You can also slice things off and everything. Right. So like, what if I had a shape that was maybe like a big cylinder, mm -hmm. but I want it to sit in the table, so I actually cut the bottom off. Right. And now I end up with something that, when it sits, it's more of like like this. Shape. Yeah. Like not the best idea, but this the concept of you can cut, slice, add. Right. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's another kind of intersection where you're actually sort of uh, intersecting with maybe another form or just a line to split things up to create new functions. Mm -hmm. um, so, Reed, let's uh, let's move on to move the uh, to the flow forms. Okay, cool. Um, so, let's see. Do you want to talk about them, and I'll grab our our cans sure, over here. Sure, sure. Give me the hard one, James. <laughs> okay, you're sitting getting the cans. Yeah. Okay, so flow forms, like James said before, it's much more. Think about it as kind of like car design. How the side doors of a car have very flowing, intersecting shapes. I think another way you can think about it is flowing water. Hence the term flow form. If you've ever seen Ross Lovegrove's water bottle that has, mm. it looks like it's flowing water. I think that's a pretty good way to think about it. Um, albeit that's one that's much more organic. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is kind of to start by drawing a few shapes or just lines, and then you can start connecting it and just using your perspective lines. You can see, like, I still like to draw somewhat in perspective, like these are all kind of going to a vanishing point. Mm -hmm. But since you have at least one starting point in perspective, you can kind of make these connecting lines do whatever you want. Right. And then you can start doing whatever things you feel like, like maybe it actually dips down the bottom and then this is like that, and now you end up with this whole yeah. crazy shape, and now I'm thinking, oh, maybe it actually stands up, and then the top's over here, and it looks more like mm. this. That's cool. Like, that could be a cool pencil sharpener now. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, uh, I mean, one of the products that's sort of like the most obvious flow form is our irons, mm -hmm. and they're... I mean, if you look at an iron, they're only really defined in terms of their outer shape by three lines. So maybe you have your top top line, which is like sort of the spine of the iron. Mm -hmm. You have your bottom line that, that defines that profile of uh, the iron face. And then you have this connecting line. And that's, I mean, that's it pretty much. I mean, you know, then from there you can sort of fill in the rest of your iron, but... Um, yeah, flow forms can be fairly simple, but the one thing that really defines them is that feeling of flow and sort of directionality mm -hmm. um, that they have. So and movement, I think. It's yeah, a movement for it. sure. One thing that Michael uh, Hoffman is asking right now is, you guys are right now working with black and white sketches. At mm -hmm. which point and for what reasons would you start introducing colors? Mm -hmm. uh, you started shading actually one of your sketches, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but when do you start introducing colors or shades uh, to these shapes? Do you want to answer? Uh, I think that when you're when you're adding color in, obviously you are you have a feeling that this is something worth talking about, you know, worth fleshing out a little bit more. And especially if you're working within a team, I think it can be good in terms of creating a hierarchy of the ideas and showing maybe how you went from this idea to this idea to this idea amidst all the sort of <laughs> chaos of your iteration process. Um, it's really, it's a, it's a communication tool. So you're communicating to yourself more about the, uh, about the materiality and things like that. But uh, you're also maybe communicating to a client or a team mm -hmm. about your decision making process. Yeah. I mean, I usually, I have them here, but I'm not using them right now, but what I usually have is just a few gray markers and one or two pop colors, mm -hmm. basically just something to give a little bit of shape. So like, this sketch is ugly, so I'm gonna get rid of it. But like, let's say the flow form we're designing is something like, let's just make up a thing that converges on itself, like a bike seat or something, I don't know. This looks more like a axe head or something, but. Oh, so cool. whatever this shape is, I don't know what it is. But what I can start doing is you can see how this thing kind of curves and transitions to flat. So I can go and kind of just add a few little cross hatches just to show there's a shadow there. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a big highlight right there. 
And then I always like to go and give that little extra shadow on the bottom because that helps really tell the sh tell what's happening with the form. Since the shadow is pointed, you can see this is really going from this like this big round back to a pointed front. And this is something you can do really quickly. The next step would be adding some marker. If you wanted to add a little bit of gray, just something to give a little bit of contrast. Because the point of sketching, like you said, is to communicate ideas. And that inquire, it requires communicating the form. So if you have a light source, you can tell a lot about an object than if you actually have it as black and white shapes. And then the colors would be more of, let's say the, I don't even know how this is a pencil sharpener. But let's say the pencil, <laughs> the pencil sharpener is right here. Like, I might shade, make this part green just to really say, like, that's what's most important. Mm. And color is a way for you to visually make people look where you want them to look. Right. So if you use I wouldn't do, like, this and then have, like, a bunch of screws in blue and then have, like, a big purple insert. Because now all of a sudden it's confusing and no one knows where to look. But color is a way for you to show form and get people to see what you want quickly. So on a similar note, as a follow-up question, Carl is asking, you know, uh, you're probably not always going to be sketching with the uh, Sharpies. And I think that I'll use also that as a segue where just mentioning the printer that you use for those two printers. And I, I think that you printed those in the Rep Plus, and we have the same print on the back yeah. in method, right? So it's kind of like similar problem as in when would you use a draft tool, like a tool to get you started as a Sharpie, and when do you get into more detail uh, set of tools, whether that be a finer pen tip, or in the case of the printers, you know, a printer that has a little bit uh, higher precision or accuracy. Mm -hmm. I, I think you have a really great philosophy around this. I don't even remember what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was basically, it's like, um, you start off with, man, I have a whole, it's on my YouTube it, channel. You start with thick, thick pens and you go down to thinner the pens. The basic thing is like, you start with thick pens and then you get down to thinner um, pens, but you start with small paper and you get to bigger paper. So as time goes, you're transitioning between it because in the beginning, I want to have a thick pen and a thin, a small piece of paper because then it's only about, that's going to make a square, it's only about this idea. Like all I can do is draw the big basic idea. But if I have a thin pen, then all of a sudden it feels like you're supposed to be filling in more volume, you can put more detail. So if I go to then, let's say my next one I usually do is eight and a half by 11 cut in half. Um, then I'll go to like a medium line weight pen, more like a pen, pen tell or a paper mate flare. Because now I can put a little more detail, but it's not so detailed. And then the final one I'll go to is like a big piece of paper with maybe, I never sketch a ballpoint just because I don't work well with them, but like a thin line of some sort because then you can get really detailed and like show every little parting line and all those things. Mm -hmm. So it's just fat marker to thin markers, right. small paper to big paper as you progress through the process right. in general. And when it comes to the printers, I mean, it's all about what are you assessing in that moment? I think like, you know, these these sort of quicker prints that we did, it's, it's all about form. Like yeah. the function is is maybe an element of it. I mean, obviously, with this flow form I did, I was sort of assessing this this handhole uh, for this idea. But mm -hmm. I think it's mostly about form assessment. When you're getting into more detailed prints, that's when you're you know you're really assessing the the curvature of the thing, but also the the functionality, perhaps. Yeah, I think your first prints can be just like very low fill, just whatever is the yeah. fastest one possible, as yeah. long as you don't crush it because it's too thin. Yeah, but and that's one really it. <laughs> one thing that I started doing, which I found really effective at at one of my jobs, was I started doing prints, but then I would actually uh, put clay onto it mm -hmm. if I was trying to make edits. Um, and trying to see how a certain curve might feel. Mm -hmm. And then I can go back. And so it's a communication. I mean, it's honestly like printing is the strongest communication we have with CAD right now and CAD programs because you can be in CAD all day and not really understand like yeah. the true proportions of your design. Well, that's also why I think you should jump back and forth between sketching, printing, rendering, sketching, printing, rend whatever you do because like this thing, it has a lot of curves in it. It's, it definitely wasn't perfectly curvature continuous when I modeled it, but it gets the point across in a model. And then, like you said, I can <laughs> literally sand it, put clay on it. I can take a picture of it, draw on it. Yeah. I can do a quick render, print it out, draw on that. Instead of getting hung up on having everything be perfect, you can just do everything as far as you need and then add a different skill to fill in the gaps. Eventually, you get to a point where you have to make like 
perfect A side CAD that you can have tooled and everything, but you don't need to do that up front. It's right. about speed and just getting to the ideas is where they need to be. Yeah. Um, one more, one last thing before we move on is that I think that especially the flow form families, but form families in general, when you're in this stage, I think trying as hard as you can not to create sort of scratchy line work to really increase your confidence in line work so that, uh, you know, I see a lot of people when they're starting out, they're trying to get that perfect line. And so they're really timid about it. But I think in the form families, you can be really quick and dirty and build up that confidence in your line work. So when you're doing flow forms, just use a couple lines, define the form as best you can, then move on to the next one. Whether you're trying to refine that idea, trying to refine that sketch, I think sketching something and moving on um, instead of mm -hmm. just sort of scratching at it. Yeah, you can. It's funny. People try and fix their sketches by redrawing the lines that they think were wrong. But then you draw on it so many times, all you see is the mistake. Right. Well, that's why I, I love drawing with light marker first because it doesn't matter how messed up something right. is. It will always just blend into the background, and if it doesn't, it adds character. And honestly, I know for me, like a lot of my drawings I put online are very tight and everything, but mm. they start super loose. Mm. And a lot of times when you actually have things loose in front of clients, it makes them feel like you didn't spend hours on it. So they feel like they can actually like critique it. Mm. Opposed to they get a little up the head, like am I gonna offend this person? Right. And it's better to be offended early than to wait <laughs> to the end and have the whole thing fall apart. Yeah, exactly. And you shouldn't get offended though. <laughs> so uh, this last form family. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay. Read. So yeah, blob form families. Um, this one is the one that James talked about with being very pebbly and organic. So it's kind of fun because the way that we were taught to do it was just kind of start with like some type of shape. It's like the Chicago bean. Um, and then if you know what cross sections are, it's basically the lines that split things down axes. So this form, this ax it was probably built in CAD this way where this is probably the right face, this is the front face, top is right here, something like that. But if you split it down the right face, you now have a line that follows this whole thing. And if you use those in sketching, you can define something. Right now, this just looks like an amoeba. But if I go in here and add one section line, now you can say, oh, it goes up, it dips, and goes up again. And if I do the same thing over here, now you can tell, oh, it's a bean. That's like what it looks like. Yeah. It's like if you guys have seen that, what's it, ultra black? What's that paint that NASA came oh, out with? Oh, yeah. Vantablack. Vantablack, that's it. Um, it sucks up 99.9% .9 of light. So you see a piece of crinkled aluminum, and you see all of the different textures on it, but then you flip it over with the Vantablack, and you can't, it looks like it's this black. You can't tell. That's like what this is. This is like flipping the Vantablack over and seeing all of the highlights and everything. Right, right. So you start out with that profile, and mm -hmm. then you, you build a form within it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, with other form families, you're kind of building it line by line and, and generating it from the ground up. Here, you're starting with that outer profile mm -hmm. and working in. So I think we put this one last because this one seems like it's the most flowy, which it is, but you still have to have an understanding of perspective in there as well. Yeah. Like, like if I did this thing where I could have done this blob like this, and now all of a sudden you can see there's some type of what's going on here. Like this is going to go here, and then this is going to – like there is – something going around a corner and just understanding how foreshortening works and perspective works and things is going to help you right communicate those things a little bit better but i think it's also good i know you do this too i think is like going in and adding those really quick like highlight shadow marks and things yeah because then it just gives you that little extra information of like oh there's a big highlight right here and there's a shadow here and right. if it's like that that means the light source is going to be like over here so it's all little things that you add up over time. Yeah. One interesting thing about these uh, shapes is they are fairly complex, as you guys mentioned before. And Dakota here is asking, you know, how do you have you ever come across with a concept that's uh, really interesting but hard to prototype? Like the geometry is interesting, mm -hmm. but it might be a little bit too complex. Like maybe those are also interesting uh, examples of the prints that you have, where it's not a straightforward shape, mm -hmm. uh, but still something that you want to try and create physically. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think these forms definitely push you out of your comfort zone, especially when it comes to CAD, because you got to break out the surfaces and the, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, the surfaces, the splines. It's not, it's not that straightforward, but I think if you can, while you're generating these forms and before you take them into CAD, if you can start to define what that front side uh, top looks like, you can, and you can also, one thing that I like about these forms a lot is that you can sketch out that side profile and it doesn't matter, you know, if it's, if that form or that line is completely logical, like the spline can fit to your line and you can, oh my gosh, I feel like Dr. Seuss. So, uh, so yeah, if you put that in as, as sort of your backdrop within your CAD, you can really mimic that line and you know, something that's really hard to do sometimes in CAD is to get that feeling that you get from your sketch and the line work of your sketch. And that's one way that you can bridge that gap. Um, so, yeah. I agree. So we have another, like speaking about Dr. Suis, I suppose there's a nine-year-old who's asking. Nine no years Year nine student. Oh, year nine student. Yeah. <laughs> that was really I got impressed. excited for a second. It's was, always great to hear like younger generations take over. But uh, he's asking about the fear of or overcoming the fear of a blank page. I think that we've over all experienced it as a designer. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have too much white space in a page, uh, how do you go about it uh, when sketching? Yeah, I think that's also in reference to just like st starting a sketch because it can be very intimidating. You feel like you have to have that idea fully formed in your mind and one wrong line and it's all, you know, it's gone to waste. But I remember actually Joe Ballet in one of the first demos that he did for us was he like squiggled on a page and said, this page is not precious. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to treat it as, as a tool and not as, uh, you know, that somebody is making up a frame for the sketch as you complete it and you're just going to yeah. plop it in there, put it up on the wall, there you go, there's your piece of art. Um, Design is not art. It yes. can be, but it doesn't have to be. Right. Yeah, this is, this is all about communication and right now this is a, a communicating back and forth between yourself and the page. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is a tool for you. I mean, you could certainly take this to... Uh, maybe your boss or something, and they would understand what you were getting at. I don't know if you would bring this to a client. It, de it depends on the client. Yeah. Sometimes we have clients that really understand design, and they're in the room with us. Um, sometimes you need to give them the most polished thing ever, or else they don't understand it. Also, sometimes it depends on your client what they consider as value. Like, if you give them sketches, they're like, what do we pay you all this money for? <laughs> but if you give them a render, they're like, oh, I under okay, good. We got our money's worth out of this. Right. So it depends. And also, sometimes clients are super specific, and they're like, I want 30 concepts. Mm. Where I think that's usually the short-sighted way of, like, how I'm paying X money divided by 30 concepts is how much money I paid for concept. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like, you can show whatever you want. I think it just depends on knowing who you're presenting to and how is the best way to do it. Yeah. I think that also, I think Reed, you mentioned it, a great hack is your technique of using a smaller paper. So if you have mm -hmm. too big of a white space, maybe a smaller paper can help you have less. Yeah. 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 That's I very true. Also, to, to agree, but also to counter that point, I remember that um, one of the things that I, that I really liked that I was taught by one of my first managers uh, was... Uh, he always loved to sketch in those biggie newsprint sketchbooks. Mm -hmm. And in there, we would have, especially when we brought in interns who weren't so confident in sketching, we would ask them to sketch in these books and to draw through your lines, get big, get big with it, because that will build up the muscle necessary to then go down to smaller pieces of paper, mm -hmm. and it will also build up your confidence because you're not sketching so tightly. I think one of the things about small pieces of paper is people naturally start to sketch too tightly. Mm. Um, and I think if you can start big, especially early in your sketching career, and then come down to the smaller pieces. That's true. When I was, I remember I was a freshman in college and I built a model and I built it like the size of a post-it note. And it was the one time it was in your pocket yesterday and something got smashed, <laughs> where he flicked it off the table and goes, too small, and it's washed out. <laughs> it's like, make things bigger. You yeah. can't see any, you can hide your flaws in small things. Right. But that's why I like small in the beginning because you don't have to worry about it. You just think about the big idea. 
So yeah, I guess you an argument for both sides. Yeah. But I think if you're going big, still make it big, but make it a super fat marker or something. Right. Just so you're just thinking about the general gesture. Like, look when James is drawing. It's all continuous line. Nothing's precious. Figuring it out as you go. Yeah. But since it's on a bigger paper, you can have that little bit more detail that you couldn't have on a post-it or something like that. Exactly. Which is nice. All right, what else is good to draw here? <laughs> Think of something crazy. <laughs> the old infinity sharpener. Yep. I don't know how this works. Here we go. Okay, it's kind of... Yeah, that's good enough. You know, you get, that's the, cool. you get the idea. Yeah. Also, everyone, I love this type of really gestural quick stuff. Like two seconds. You, like some people be there and like draw every shaving. Just put a few squiggles. Like when I draw people at work, this is how I draw a person. Done. Boom. <laughs> two seconds. I know that guy. Yeah. And now look how big my pencil sharpeners are. <laughs> like, that's all you need to do. Give scale for These things. are pencil sharpeners from the prehistoric era. Yeah. Yeah. And this man's also tiny. <laughs> do you have any other questions? Well, actually, I think that I do want to open it up for uh, the Q and A and start rounding things up. Yeah. Uh, Sweet. You know, to, to, to get back here. Uh, th so first of all, thank you guys. You know, uh, we've went. I, I guess you can reiterate like the families that we've discussed so far, uh, and yeah, general takeaway from the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the process is one that I'm always surprised with the stuff that comes out of it, where I probably. Everyone, I did an, a talk at Kane University a few weeks ago about inspiration. And I feel like everyone gets stuck in the same trap of what's on Les Manouche, what's on Pinterest, what's cool. And those things are obviously good North Stars, but I wouldn't have ever made like a weird, like logitech y mousey type looking thing. Like yeah. that came from drawing this and having that dinosaur looking thing sitting right there. Yeah. So it's just the fun stuff that you don't think about. Mm. Yeah. I, I do think, you know, to reiterate, it's sort of taking the product, taking away your preconceived notions about it and pushing it through this framework to find, yeah, those unexpected moments that you just, you just wouldn't come into it with. It, this is really, it's, it's, it is kind of like play. This mm -hmm. is, this is play. This is sort of improvisational jazz. Mm -hmm. It's, it's unexpected, but you can find really delightful, yeah. uh, interesting ideas out of it. I think it goes back to the question of when do you add in reality of solving the problem? Mm. If you're thinking about that only in the beginning, you're just gonna make a box with a hole that you put a pencil in and you twist it. Yeah. Like you're not gonna get the other things that are gonna make that more enjoyable or just different or whatever outcome you're actually looking for. Right. So that's, I think that's great, especially that you mentioned you know, it's a framework. So we shown the the watering plant uh, cans we've mm -hmm. shown the, the the sharpeners we also have here on the screen like one of your uh, projects from before read the, the planters, the planters. Mm -hmm. so it's interesting how no matter what the project at hand might be you can still apply this thinking process mm -hmm. and it's ultimately about getting as many ideas out as you can so that and I, I think we have a question uh, about the process itself on documenting it so it's Getting those ideas out, and then how do you go about documenting all of these, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fairly chaotic process, and then making it into something that you can present? Uh, I think Jacob asked that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's one reason why I like doing post-it note sketches in the beginning, because mm -hmm. you're putting them all on individual post-its. Mm -hmm. Like obviously, when you do this type of stuff, it's a lot harder to lay it out, and it's also it's, it's a weird thing where what people put in a portfolio basically what happens in real life is kind yeah. of a disconnect. Like you have to clean it up to make someone want to see it, mm -hmm. but it probably didn't happen that smoothly. Like no one's perfect all the time. Yeah. So that's why I like post-its because then afterwards I can move them around and bucket them and then figure out what makes sense. So then you're actually documenting the real, at least for me, the real order of events that actually got me to figure out like, these are weird, that's cool, I like this one, and then you took those in the CAD later. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think one of the things that you even see through our presentation um, is the fact that we did these sort of really <laughs> messy brainstorms when we were coming up with the watering cans. But at the end of each brainstorm, mm -hmm. we would sit down and draw out, like, this is our idea from these sort of rough ske sketches. We would do a one-pager, this is our idea, this mm -hmm. is what we're going to model out next. Yeah. 
Um, so I think it's a great backdrop. It shows a lot of work and a lot of thought that went into it, yeah. but then you're showing the culmination of that. And I feel like even if you don't have it as specific as post-its, but it's more like this, where you have all these cool ideas, what James and I did after each one was we went through, we picked out the ones we liked, and then the best ones, we would either take that or combine it, and then we would do one final sketch of that one, yeah, that's and true. then go into CAD. Yeah. Because you don't want to you don't want to be figuring out every detail in CAD, or else, if you're like me, you'll get sucked in there for, like, oh my god, it's been six hours, why am I <laughs> still putting out this fillet, or this curvature continuous face. Yeah. And using that CAD segue, you know, uh, we mentioned about also being able to iterate on the on a physical way so that, you know, in, in the, case of, the case of Mercabot, we will try to print everything, right? Mm -hmm. So we have here uh, our lineup, our printer lineup, and, you know, ultimately, the, for us, it's also important to allow people to be able to jump back and forth between the sketching world, the physical world, back into the sketching world. You know, you, you also mentioned the rendering world. Overall, we have uh, three printers in our lineup, the Replicator Plus, which is the one that you guys used for these ones, uh, Method, which is on the left, that's like for more professional applications, and the Z18, which I have a, I, I love just bringing this, this prototype always, because it's like one within a while. <laughs> and now it's gonna sketch and the form uh, families. Yeah, exactly, you just have a robot to sketch for you. Uh, this was printed on the, on the C18, but, uh, the point being, you know, there's different <laughs> available depending on how big, I guess, uh, of a print you want to do or how accurate you want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, also worth mentioning that we are running now a promo for professional users on Method. Uh, you're able to save uh, up to $1,500, which is pretty sweet for that printer. Um, you know, I, I want to also allow people to ask questions, but just, you know, two things before we get into the Q&A. Um, the, do reach out at hello at MakerBot if you have any follow-up questions or specific questions around either promo, the printers themselves, and also uh, we'll be sending out, uh, you guys can mention the handles, but we'll be sending out information with uh, Reed and James's uh, YouTube accounts and your Instagram accounts mm -hmm. for people to follow up. Mm -hmm. But if you want to mention it right now so that sure. somebody can have a go cool. ahead. Yeah, I'm just at Reed Schlegel, super simple, just <laughs> my name. On all accounts. Everything, yeah. Yeah. I am a little bit more confusing than that. I have, uh, I draw on receipts on Instagram. Um, and then also the Minor Details podcast that I do with Nick Baker. We have an Instagram. We have a YouTube channel. I don't have a personal YouTube channel yet. Um, but yeah, so. Yeah, so we'll be sending uh, a follow-up information for everybody who, who wants to get that. But do reach out. You know, it does help us a lot with producing these and answering those questions at hello at MakerBot. And having said that, we'll open it up for a few questions from the audience. You've asked all of them. I've asked all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, guys. <laughs> no, I think it. You know, uh, it's it's interesting. You know, to touch on again, going back on this idea between the back and forth and the preciousness of a sketch, whether that be, and I like calling sometimes the print sketches as well, just because it's important for you to be able to have the ability to prototype in paper, in 3D form, mm -hmm. and be comfortable with airing, right? Like, I, I don't know if we can touch on that uh, once more. Like, the, the importance of being comfortable with failing so that you can actually get somewhere. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think failure is all a part of the process. I think, mm -hmm. I think uh, you know, we call things iterations, but essentially they're failures. You know, they're, <laughs> they're you know, they're not outright failures. Nobody's going to call you out for them. But I think that, you know, these things are... Um, stepping stones to something more finished, final, uh, you know, you, but we're also proud to show our mistakes. And I think that we should be because we've learned things from these mistakes and it's mm -hmm. important in the storytelling process. Yeah. Perfection's a myth. <laughs> um, I have a question saying, when is the follow-up session? Um, specifically on, they're really interested in knowing on, like, how do you start zeroing in on a final design mm -hmm. and taking it to a, to a prototype and to a so actually, uh, you know, we do have plans to doing more of this. If this is the first time that you join the MakerBot sessions, do make sure to subscribe to a, a emailing list. And then also, again, I'll just say that, hello at MakerBot. We have to define that. At the moment, though, we do have our, cer our student certification that will be featuring Reed. Uh, that's an interesting way to, to follow up on that. Where you go, I don't know if you want to touch briefly on that, but we developed a um, mm -hmm. certification with you where you teach people how to not only sketch, but the whole process, design thinking, thinking process. 
Yeah, that one is um, a very digestible version of what design thinking is. So it's basically how do you identify a problem, how do you ideate around the problem, and then how can you see it in real life and validate it. So yeah, if you're interested in that, we can definitely talk about it. And this is something that we touched on briefly there, but this definitely mm -hmm. goes a lot more into the how do you figure out what it looks like, how it works part of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess uh, we're good with questions now. Then, you know, thank you guys again for joining us today. We are, uh, again, super excited and thrilled of having you guys here. We'll probably want to do more of these in the future, but for you guys out there in the computer, do, you know, reach out because it's important for us to know that you're engaged and that you're interested in this. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Cool. Oh, another question, maybe. Oh, man, oh, it's stuck in there. You guys did oh. So when we start the session, you have to... <laughs> they're like, wait, questions? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, do you move straight from sketch to 3D print, or do you still see a use for card, paper, or blue phone modeling? I wish I could sketch it, and then all of a sudden it would come out of the 3D printer. <laughs> if I could skip CAD, that would make my life so happy. Yeah. But do you ever use uh, just rough models? Yeah, on occasion. It depends on what it is. Like for a blob thing, I'd probably go into CAD. I would make kind of what I would call like sketch CAD, where mm -hmm. it wouldn't put it in a key shot because you'd see all the weird wobbliness and everything. But right. in a print, you can get it out to look close enough. Yeah. Well, one of the cool things about, especially like the Tecto forms, is even if you just have paper around, you can start to iterate on profiles with mm -hmm. your piece of paper. So, you know, I'm just like, creating sort of a profile and maybe I would sketch this out first but maybe I would just kind of like take this right into modeling and then you know what could this start to inspire mm -hmm. I mean you can do you can do that way as well it doesn't necessarily have to be that you're exploring these forms only in sketch um, you could be abstracting these forms using the things that you have lying around yeah I mean I think it's also nice to do cross-section sketches where it's like you can sketch it and then cut it and it's maybe better if it's on phone core or something like that, has a little strength mm -hmm. to it. But if you do a profile, cut it out, do another profile, stick it together, yeah. and then you can start like you could start piecing it together in your mind. Uh, I probably do that a little less frequently, to be fully honest, but it's something that if it's the fastest way I can get something out, I'd rather spend ten minutes cutting something out of phone core than two hours making the file and then waiting for it to print for three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then also another question I, I heard about is whether this will be available for people to look afterwards. So yeah, they are all in the MakerBot channel. You also have your channel. We'll be sending people out uh, links for that. And uh, yeah, just to reiterate that, you know, just the sketching, the 3D printing is a tool of many that a designer has. Uh, we, uh, well, I, I, here at MakerBot, we're lucky to have millions, or not millions, but hundreds of printers probably to use, <laughs> uh, which is a lot of fun, I'll, I'll tell you that. But yeah, it's like, you know, whatever's fastest, easiest, and, you know, you feel mm -hmm. the most comfortable. Sometimes it's even prototyping with things that are already there, like putting that uh, sharpener and editing it out or yeah. uh, mixing things that you have lying around. So, yeah. I think something else is going to think about is you don't have to 3D print the whole thing. Mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. can, if I just like this detail, yeah. I can just model that quickly and then just check that out in real life and then put clay on it or paper. It's about picking, you don't... You don't have to be one track minded. Mm -hmm. You can pick and choose pieces that you need as you need them. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Great. Thanks so for again. tuning in. Yes. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for having us. Yes. It's been fun. Yeah. yeah thank you guys. And uh, thanks everybody out there. Uh, we'll hope to see you guys soon. And thank you. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Happy sketching.